Pharaoh has some troubling dreams, and who does he find to interpret them? <laughs> Greetings and welcome to the Bible Paladin. In our last reading, Joseph was left to rot in an Egyptian dungeon. But as we will soon find out, God has not forgotten him. And in this beautifully written tale, we hear about his reversal of fortune, and also some inspiring lessons about our relationship with the Lord. But before we get into it, let's talk a little bit about the setting of this story. I've been doing a lot of research on this to get a good idea of the Egyptian culture that Joseph would have been living in during this period. With that being said, there doesn't seem to be a lot of agreement amongst biblical scholars as to when these events would have taken place in Egyptian history, because there really isn't a lot of historical records of them outside the biblical text. Plus, a number of biblical scholars don't even agree that Joseph was a historical figure as we see him in the book of Genesis. However, one theory that I found is that the story may have taken place during the Hyksos dynasty, or the time of foreign rulers. This would have been sometime between 1630 and 1530 BC, under Pharaoh Kion or Apophis. Some reasons for this would have been that the Hyksos did not keep good records, giving us the reason why Joseph is not mentioned, and as foreign rulers, they would have been more sympathetic to raising someone like Joseph to a high position. The other time period scholars advocate is that of the Middle Kingdom, 2000 to 1786 BC. Some pharaohs suggested might be Sesotris the second or third, or Amenemhat the third, who ruled during a time of prosperity. It is also recorded that slaves were first commonly used during this period, even giving us the prices paid for slaves, which match up with the story. I've included some links in the description below if you are interested in a little bit more about this history and the time periods that this could have taken place. With that being said, let's jump into the story and pray for the guidance and wisdom of the Holy Spirit as we read the sacred text. After a lapse of two years, Pharaoh had a dream. He saw himself standing by the Nile, when up out of the Nile came seven cows, handsome and fat. They grazed in the reed grass. Behind them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile. And standing on the bank of the Nile beside the others, the ugly, gaunt cows ate up the seven handsome, fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had another dream. He saw seven ears of grain, fat and healthy, growing on a single stalk. Behind them sprouted seven ears of grain, thin and blasted by the east wind. And the seven thin ears swallowed up the seven fat, healthy ears. Then Pharaoh woke up to find it was only a dream. Next morning, his spirit was agitated. So he summoned all the magicians and sages of Egypt and recounted his dreams to them, but no one could interpret his dreams for him. Two more years have passed since Joseph had interpreted the dreams of his fellow inmates, so we're not sure how long he was in prison in total. And then the narrative shifts to Pharaoh and his dreams, in which he is standing by the Nile. It is interesting that the Hebrew word used is yeor, which simply means the river, or the great river. Of course, when you're in Egypt, the Nile is the only river that's worth talking about, and would be understood as such. And if you haven't liked or subscribed yet, you might be in denial. Because this is a great channel, and you don't want to miss any upcoming episodes. Yeah, don't tell jokes. You can't tell jokes. You never could tell jokes. Sorry, sorry. Okay, let's continue. Now, the dreams themselves don't seem that difficult to interpret, but maybe it's because I've heard this story a number of times since I was a child. It has been documented that the interpretation of dreams was practiced in ancient Egypt. In fact, they have discovered a document known as the Chester Beatty Papyrus, which is believed to go back to 1350 BC. It is what would be called a dream book, which contained various symbols and activities found in dreams and what they could mean. Of course, in this story, none of the magicians or oracles in the royal court were able to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. And they would have been dedicated people to do just that, as they did believe that the deities spoke to them through dreams. Because Pharaoh had two similar dreams back to back, it was believed to be an important message from the gods. And there's another element in play here, too, because it's not that the dreams were just for Pharaoh's sake, but they would be a means to set Joseph free. And so let's continue and see what happens. Then the chief cupbearer spoke up and said to Pharaoh, On this occasion, I am reminded of my negligence. Once, when Pharaoh was angry, he put me and the chief baker in custody in the house of the chief steward. Later, we both had dreams on the same night, and each of our dreams had its own meaning. There with us was a Hebrew youth, a slave of the chief steward, and when we told him our dreams, he interpreted them for us and explained for each of us the meaning of his dreams. And it turned out just as he told us. I was restored to my post, 
but the other man was impaled. Pharaoh therefore had Joseph summoned, and then hurriedly brought him forth from the dungeon. After he shaved and changed his clothes, he came into Pharaoh's presence. Pharaoh then said to him, I had certain dreams that no one can interpret, but I hear it said of you that the moment you are told a dream, you can interpret it. It is not I, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God who will give Pharaoh the right answer. And so the chief cupbearer suddenly remembers Joseph, for Pharaoh's situation very much mirrored the situation that he had with the baker while in prison. And it's interesting to note that he doesn't refer to Joseph as a fellow inmate, but rather the slave of the captain of the guard, because that was the rule that he had while he was in the prison. And while he was a bit late in advocating for Joseph, it just goes to show that God works in his time and not in our time. And if Joseph had been released two years earlier, he may have never had the opportunity to speak before Pharaoh. I also love the detail that Joseph shaved and changed his clothing before meeting with the king. From a practical note, you might imagine how he would look after many years in prison. But this also speaks to the customs of the Egyptians. Unlike most of their neighbors, Egyptian men preferred to be clean-shaven, and one was expected to look presentable if they were to go before the royal court, especially in the capacity in which Joseph was called, as he was expected to be an oracle for the pharaoh. Finally, when Pharaoh does see Joseph, he informs him that he has been told that Joseph can interpret any dream, and so he expects Joseph to do so. Now, Joseph, in his humility, says that it is not I who interprets the dreams, but rather it is God who will satisfy what you want. And he tells him this, one, because that is the faith that he has in the Lord, but also because he doesn't consider himself to be a magician like the other Egyptians. And also, again, he uses the word Elohim for God, so that the Egyptian or Pharaoh himself would think that Joseph was referring to any of the gods, and they had many to choose from. So, let's return to the dreams. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, In my dream I was standing on the bank of the Nile, when up from the Nile came seven cows, fat and well-formed. They grazed in the reed grass. Behind them came seven other cows, scrawny, most ill-formed and gaunt. Never have I seen such ugly specimens as these in all the land of Egypt. The gaunt, ugly cows ate up the first seven fat cows, but when they had consumed them, no one could tell that they had done so, because they looked as ugly as before. Then I woke up. In another dream, I saw seven ears of grain, fat and healthy, growing on a single stalk. Behind them sprouted seven ears of grain, shriveled and thin and blasted by the east wind and the seven thin ears swallowed up the seven healthy ears. I have spoken to the magicians, but none of them can give me an explanation. Joseph said to Pharaoh, Both of Pharaoh's dreams have the same meaning. God has thus foretold to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven healthy cows are seven years, and the seven healthy ears are seven years, the same in each dream. So also the seven thin, ugly cows that came up after them are seven years as are the seven thin, wind-blasted ears. They are seven years of famine. It is just as I told Pharaoh. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are now coming throughout the land of Egypt, but these will be followed by seven years of famine, when all the abundance in the land of Egypt will be forgotten. When the famine has ravaged the land, no trace of the abundance will be found in the land because of the famine that follows it. So utterly severe will that famine be. That Pharaoh had the same dream twice means that the matter has been reaffirmed by God and that God will soon bring it about. Therefore, let Pharaoh seek out a wise and discerning man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Pharaoh should also take action to appoint overseers so as to regiment the land during the seven years of abundance. They should husband all the food of the coming good years, collecting the grain under Pharaoh's authority to be stored in the towns for food. This food will serve as a reserve for the country against the seven years of famine that are to follow in the land of Egypt, so that the land may not perish in the famine. We have the dreams repeated, Joseph's interpretation of the dreams, and his recommendation on how to handle the situation based on the meaning of the dreams. Now, in hindsight, the dreams seem pretty easy to interpret, with the grain and the cattle being symbols for fertility and prosperity, or even food. And also, we've seen the number seven quite a few times throughout Genesis. But it's interesting that it was not just a significant number for the Israelites, but also for the Hebrews. They too saw it as a sacred number that represented wholeness or completeness. But here, Joseph interprets the number literally, 
as seven years, seven years of abundance, followed by seven years of famine. But Joseph does not stop with the interpretation. He goes on to tell Pharaoh exactly how he would handle the situation and lays out an entire strategic plan. It almost seems like he's at an executive level job interview. In addition, he recommends that Pharaoh appoint someone who has the wisdom and ability to execute such a plan. Whether he realizes it or not, he basically describes himself and shows why he would be perfect for the position. We should hire him. And so, how does Pharaoh respond? This advice pleased Pharaoh and all his officials. Could we find another like him? Pharaoh asked his officials. A man so endowed with the Spirit of God? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, no one can be as wise and discerning as you are. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people shall dart at your command. Only in respect to the throne shall I outrank you. Herewith, Pharaoh told Joseph, I place you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. With that, Pharaoh took off his signet ring and put it on Joseph's finger. He had him dressed in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. He then had him ride in the chariot of his vizier, and they shouted, Abrek, before him. Thus was Joseph installed over the whole land of Egypt. I, Pharaoh, proclaim, he told Joseph, that without your approval, no one shall move hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also bestowed the name of zaphnath paneah on Joseph, and he gave him in marriage to Azanath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of Heliopolis. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Just as Potiphar and the overseer of the prison had put Joseph in charge of everything, so too does Pharaoh. Realize that he is the third person to do so. And he also recognizes that Joseph has wisdom, which also meant that he had a supernatural insight. But also, he's able to think strategically like a statesman. And this is why Pharaoh appoints him immediately. And the way that he appoints him is actually very consistent in what we know about ancient Egypt and what they might have done for someone to be raised to that particular position. He would now be considered a vizier or governor of the royal palace. The signet ring would be a mark of his office but also used to sign and seal papyrus documents. The fine linen and gold chain would serve to indicate his high rank and badge of honor as well. He would be second only to Pharaoh and even in processions ride in the second chariot. We are told that people would shout Abrech before him, which is a word that has been highly disputed among scholars. The most common translation from the Hebrew is bow the knee, but could also be understood as attention or oh yes, oh yes. Jerome translated it as tender father, as an expression of his authority at such a young age. The Egyptian phrase Abu Rech can be translated as your command is our desire. Regardless of the exact meaning, they all refer to the deference and respect the Egyptians would have expected to give him. Pharaoh finishes his commissioning of Joseph by reminding him that he is Pharaoh, but Joseph will have all authority under him. Joseph is then given the Egyptian name Zaphanath Panea, which again has been translated in a variety of ways, from Jerome's savior of the world to he who feeds the world, sustainer of life, God speaks and he lives, and revealer of secrets. All seem to speak in some way of what Joseph did or will do. And finally, he is given a wife who was the daughter of a priest of Heliopolis, which would have been a city known for the chief temple of the sun god. Marrying into the family of this high-ranking priest would also have shown Joseph to be firmly accepted as an Egyptian leader, part of the family, so to speak. His wife's name, Asenath, means belonging to the goddess Naith. Of course, it is likely that she would eventually come to learn of the God of Joseph, that is, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And with his newfound station, Joseph then goes out to the land of Egypt. We are told that he was 30 years old when this occurred, which means that he has now been in Egypt for 13 years. And so the next few verses tell us what happened during these seven years of abundance. After Joseph left Pharaoh's presence, he traveled throughout the land of Egypt. During the seven years of plenty, when the land produced abundant crops, he husbanded all the food of these years of plenty that the land of Egypt was enjoying and stored it in the towns, placing in each town the crops of the fields around it. Joseph garnered grain in quantities like the sands of the sea, so vast that at last he stopped measuring it for it was beyond measure. Before the famine year set in, Joseph became the father of two sons, born to him by Azanath, 
daughter of Potiphera, priest of Heliopolis. He named his firstborn Manasseh, meaning, God has made me forget entirely the sufferings I endured at the hands of my family. And the second he named Ephraim, meaning, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. When the seven years of abundance enjoyed by the land of Egypt came to an end, the seven years of famine set in, just as Joseph had predicted. Although there was famine in all the other countries, food was available throughout the land of Egypt. While hunger came to be felt throughout the land of Egypt, and the people cried to Pharaoh for bread, Pharaoh directed all the Egyptians to go to Joseph and do whatever he told them. When the famine had spread throughout the land, Joseph opened all the cities that had grain and rationed it to the Egyptians, since the famine had gripped the land of Egypt. In fact, all the world came to Joseph to obtain rations of grain, for famine had gripped the whole world. We are told a few things in these verses that really set us up for the chapters that will follow. First, the dreams come true just as Joseph had interpreted them, and he does exactly what he had suggested be done. And during this time of abundance, it is not only for Egypt, but also for himself and his family, as he and Asenath have two sons named Manasseh and Ephraim, who we will hear more about later. But also, their names are a bit interesting and may give us pause as we think about Joseph's continued faithfulness. Manasseh's name is said to mean that he forgets his troubles and his father's house. This immediately brings to mind the strife he encountered with his brothers, but has he completely abandoned his family altogether? Surely he must still think of his father. Ephraim's name certainly fits into his current situation, meaning God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. This also serves as a reminder that even in this place which is not his homeland or father's house, God is still with him. We're also told that the famine was not unique to Egypt, but extended throughout the whole world, which is a bit of hyperbole, but it meant that it really affected all of the regions and the surrounding countries around Egypt. And so Joseph was not only in charge of providing food for the Egyptians, but also for anyone who would come to buy grain from them. And if you're not familiar with the story, you might have already guessed who will be coming to buy grain from him. But that will have to wait till the next episode. So let's look at some of the theological observations about this chapter. The first relates to Joseph's seemingly acceptance of the Egyptian culture and way of life. Although we are not told that he accepts their gods, he would necessarily participate in their rituals, especially being married into a priestly family. How can this be reconciled with such prohibitions that we have heard earlier, especially that of his family getting rid of all their idols, bathing, and changing their clothes? By association, Joseph's bathing, shaving, and changing clothes can even be seen as an initiation into the Egyptian culture and royal household, leaving behind his own house. And yet, it is never indicated that Joseph is wrong for doing this. Quite the contrary, God is present with him throughout. He is able to live in such a culture, yet remain faithful to the Lord. And this is my takeaway from this part of the story. Even though Joseph is in the midst of a pagan nation, he does not waver in his faith or his commitment to the Lord. Even surrounded by these foreign customs and these different religious traditions, he remains faithful. Also, the Egyptians are not painted as the Canaanites were, as being completely corrupt and evil. Instead, they are a people who, just like Joseph and his family, depend on the land and want to feed their families and be safe. Even Pharaoh turns out to be an ally instead of an enemy, and Joseph does what he can to help them. In fact, it is God working through Joseph that allows these people to prosper. A common theme that we see again and again is the way in which God brings order and goodness out of tragedy. As God has done before, he uses a chaotic situation and setting to bring about his grace. Joseph is lifted up in what seems to be an incredible way, from a Hebrew slave to a royal prisoner to a royal advisor. He becomes the second most important person in all of Egypt. But God's plan is not just for Joseph or for the Egyptians, but ultimately for the people that he had entered into a covenant with, as we will see in the following chapters. Sometimes God's plan is just beyond human understanding. How might we apply any aspect of the story to our lives today? When we look at Joseph, he remains calm when he's under pressure and he relies on God. But what does this reliance look like? It is not simply giving God the glory, which he does, but also by using the gifts that God gave him. He uses wisdom when interpreting the dreams. Wisdom is a type of discernment that goes beyond knowledge or intelligence. Some have described it this way. Knowledge is understanding how to do something. Wisdom is asking whether or not it should be done. For this reason, wisdom is often connected 
with knowledge of the divine. After Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams, he utilizes knowledge, another gift given to him by God. And he does so by talking about what can be done with the information that he now has, the information that the Lord has given him. And he talks about how it can be used to serve the community, the community that he was once a slave to. This is worth reflecting upon. Those that would be considered his enemies, he is willing to help and bring them prosperity. And this theme we will see replayed throughout the story. Joseph gives of himself, using his God-given gifts to serve others. What a wonderful lesson in a time in which people seem to make a business of pitting groups against each other and defining beliefs and politics based on who one should follow or who one should despise. Joseph rises above such pettiness and asks how he can be of service. Not a bad role model, if you ask me. Thank you for joining me, and I hope you continue watching this series as we will hear about the long-awaited reunion between Joseph and his brothers. Until then, seek wisdom and do good.